Good to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. I don't like holding the microphone. Normally I got my clip on mic on my collared shirt, but that won't work on this jersey. Amen. All right. Well, hey, it is good to be in the house of God. At this time, we normally would dismiss our children's church, but here today, Faith Kids, you are in here, and uh, we're having a family Sunday. We're going to get to the Word, and uh, we're going to have a sermon before we uh, get to baptizing. Um, let's go ahead and just open up with a word of prayer, and we'll begin. Father, I love you. I need you. God, have your way in this place. Please give us of yourself. I'm asking you right now in Jesus' name to carry me, to hold me. God, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I have no seminary. I have no college, no degree. I'm a nobody that you saved and pulled from the darkness. I didn't save me. I didn't ask me to preach. I didn't tell me to move down to Winfield. I didn't start this church. I didn't give us this building. God, I'm here at your obedience, at your bid and your call. God, I'm calling on you in Jesus' name. Please carry me. Please hold me. Please flow through me as rivers of living water. Show me the scriptures, the sermon. God, I have sought you with all my heart like I always do. If I failed you, if I haven't, please forgive me of my sin. Please acquit me of hidden faults and failures. God, we need your direction and your touch now. I trust you. I know that you want to do something special in this place. Please have your will, have your way. We need you and we love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. My name is Branson Sears. I'm 40 years old. I'll turn 41 here in, uh, what's today's date? Nobody knows the date. That's all right. I'll turn 41 on February 26th. And uh, I lived in Derby my whole life. I'm from Derby. My parents graduated from Derby, lived there literally my whole life. Uh, I was born and raised in church. Uh, literally, the first 10 years of my life, church was my life. Um, if you've heard of New Spring Church on K96, and 21st, that was growing up, same pastor, I know Mark Hoover. Um, Mark Hoover, actually, he actually came down here a few weeks ago, a few, in December sometime. I know Mark Hoover, that was my childhood pastor. When I was a boy, that same church was on Mount Vernon and Hillside, and it was called Messiah Baptist Church. At that time, it was about a church of four or 500. When I was 10 years old, uh, up until that point, that had been my home church, lived in Derby, uh, knew all the books of the Bible, knew all the songs, been to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I knew all these things, these, these things were taught to me. In 1992, I was 10 years old and my life changed big time. Um, something happened with my dad and my family. Uh, there was a divorce. As you all know, divorce is an ugly thing. It rips, literally rips families apart. And... Uh, during those years, I didn't know what was going on, but my, my dad went to prison. And at that time, you know, I'd been to homeschool, public school, Christian school, and went to Sunrise, Derby Christian, Derby Public School. But at that time when that happened, when I was 10, Braylon, when my dad left, I didn't really know it at the time, but I was very, very insecure. And I was scared. And I uh, had a stepdad and other family move in. It was strange to me. And uh, we started going to a different church in Derby after that happened. And uh, during that time, I, I was very angry. I started fighting all the time. I started fighting. I started getting in trouble. I got pulled out of the Derby Middle School. And over the years, Brady, you'll remember that when we were young as teenagers, the church we went to, uh, went to in Derby, you know, when I was 17, when I moved out to Grandma Lackey's, I moved out when I was 17, and I hated church people. I hated church and church people big time. The number one tool in the hand of Satan is a bunch of religious fakes. That was true 2,000 years ago, and it's true today. I moved out when I was 17, and I started doing all the things that I wanted to do. I wanted to smoke pot. I wanted to get drunk. I wanted to go party and hang out with girls. I lived that way for close to nine years. Hard drugs, uh, drugs and alcohol, coke and meth and all that evil, nasty, wicked stuff. That was my life. That was my world. I think I've been arrested five times. Had my house raided when I was 19. DUIs, just an evil, wicked, dark lifestyle. Now, Larry, all that time while I was walking in darkness, I believed I was saved and born again. 
I actually believed that. I'm going to tell you guys why. I believed I was saved and going to heaven because I'd said a prayer. Because I'd said, Lord, forgive me, come into my life. Because I'd been baptized. I'd been baptized five times. Baptism will not save you. Baptism is an outward symbol after you have given your life to Christ. After you've repented and turned from your sin. This, see this wedding ring? This is a symbol of my marriage. Baptism is a symbol of being born again. It's incredible how much religious tradition has twisted the simplicity of the gospel. We're going to do baptisms today. You know nobody in this entire book was ever sprinkled. You know in the 15th, 16th century when they translated the English, the King James Version, you know that the word is not baptized. That's the Greek word, baptize. You know the real word is immersion. Catholic Church said, uh-oh. Uh-oh, we're not immersing people. Let's just leave it Greek, even when we translate it to English and keep people in the dark. That's what they did. Look it up. Go find out for yourself. I thought I was saved in going to heaven. Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Welcome to America. Welcome to 2023. People honoring God with their mouth while their heart is so far from him. You know, Matt, I used to live that dark lifestyle and people, people who are Christians would challenge me. And here's what I would throw in their face. Congratulations, must be nice to be Jesus Christ and be perfect. Don't judge. Whew. Better not twist scripture. The devil quotes scripture to Jesus in the temptation and he twisted the meaning. Let me tell you something. Judgment begins in the house of God. Let me just, it is possible to honor God with your mouth while walking in darkness. Let me tell you what the Bible says in the book of first John. By the way, you'd be like the Bereans. Go check out everything. Look to the word. The Bible says that those who say that they're saved and walk in darkness, the Bible says in the book of 1 John that you're a liar and the truth is not in you. What do you mean walk in darkness? Well, you know, sometimes people see my testimony, all the drugs and the alcohol. They think, oh, well, he needed that. Better be careful about being self-righteous. Better be careful about being self-righteous. Why? Because People that went to church every week, that knew scripture better than being you, rejected Jesus to his face. You may have never done drugs, alcohol in your life. You may have a PhD and be doing very well financially. Without Christ, you're headed to the same devil's hell. Why? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's equality right there. Equals. But thank God, let me tell you about more equality. For God so loved the world. That's you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There's equality. See, we're all equals at the foot of the cross. We all think that that's this art piece. It's not. Everybody look. That's a torture device that our savior was shredded and pinned to for your sin and for my sin. We put him on there. Our sin, yes, we are born under the curse. But thank God he loves us. Thank God he sent us Jesus. When I'm preaching to you this morning, I'm telling you what, everybody in this room needs to hear. Because there's so many people that think they're like Branson Sears before October 21st, 2007, that think they're saved, that think they're serving God while they intentionally walk in darkness. Oh, I know it's sin to curse with my mouth. I do it anyways. I know it's sin to have sex outside of marriage. I do it anyways. I know it's sin to curse, to get drunk. I know it's sin to be selfish, to lie, to gossip, to slander, to cheat on my taxes. I know it, and I walk and do it anyways. Bible says you're a liar. His word is not in you. So, Branson, are you saying that since October 21st, 2007, that you've never fallen, you've never messed up? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm telling you this, there's times where I've fallen in my flesh. There's times where I've fallen on my face and messed up. There's a difference between intentionally walking in darkness 
and falling on your face and messing up. I'll never forget, I'd been saved for about six months. I got in my flesh, went out and got drunk. I was turning up those spirits. Some of you thought our praise and worship in here this morning was a little bit weird. You go to the Chiefs game and you scream, top of your lungs, that's because you turn up them spirits at the game and then you're okay to be vocal and scream. Well, some of you thought we were weird this morning. Hey, listen, we're just doing it on the other side. We're turning up them spirits and we're praising God. Amen. That's good. People believe that they're saved. They believe that they're born again. And they've not even looked to the scriptures. When people challenged me on this, I, I, I went on a rabbit trail. I just now remember. Thank you, Jesus. I got drunk six months into my salvation. And I remember I kept drinking and this voice wouldn't go away. Now that voice had never been there before. And I'm like, man, just give me a couple more beers and it'll go away. That voice wouldn't go away. I woke up the next morning and broke and wept and cried. And over my 15 years of serving God, I always remembered that time I got drunk. I remember that time. Because I always remember, Lord, I never want to do that to you again. Let me tell you something. A grace, a, a faith that has not changed you will not save you. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. David, it's not a matter of trying harder. On October 21st, 2007, the old Branson died and I'm born of spirit. See, I don't have to, I don't have to escape reality. I don't, have to get, I don't have to get drunk. I don't have to smoke pot. By the way, smoking pot and getting high is sin. By the way, it is a gateway drug. By the way, I don't care how much money it brings into the state. It is a gateway drug. And if you want to argue that, you're going to have to take that trash and foolishness to somebody else because you're looking at a druggie. Preach it, Branson. So anyways, October 21st, 2007, that day my life changed. I'd lived all these years in darkness. My girlfriend, that I, uh, uh, who's my beautiful wife, Hannah now, she invited me to go to church with her family. And Mitch, I, I remember thinking to myself, sure, I'll, I'll go to church. I've been slaughtered, hammered, drunk. Well, that morning, I woke up and a name was spoken to me in my chest. You're gonna think this is strange, but my name's Branson. I was in Derby in the gym a few months before and a guy named Joplin invited me to church. Now I'm Branson. I'm Branson and he's, and I'm, I was just trying to get you involved. You? All right. So he invited me to church and people my whole life have made jokes about my name. I'm Missouri, I'm St. Louis. It's not that funny, I'm over it. But he told me that he was a pastor of a church, a newer church, the building they bought. Now remember I told you I went to a real legalistic church where I hated church people for years. He bought their building in Derby. So I remember two things. I remembered his name and I knew where they were. I remember, hey, save it preacher. Save it, dude, you're weird. Get away from me, I don't wanna go to church. October 21st, 2007, Hannah was gonna come pick me up. She was gonna take me to church, to her family's church over in Hayesville. My alarm went off October 21st in 2007, 569 South Derby, where I live with my grandma Lackey. My alarm went off. I leaned forward. I woke up, and clearly something spoke very clearly to me. I'm going to tell you what happened. Whether you believe it or not, that's fine. I'm telling you my story and what happened. I leaned forward. My alarm went off. Something spoke very clearly and said this, Joplin. I remember thinking, well, well that, that's strange. Why would... I think of this guy that I met one time in the gym a few months ago. Didn't think anything of it. I got up, got dressed. Me and Hannah drove to Hayesville. I'd been slaughtered drunk the night before, had a Gatorade. I walked a few feet in the door and the first thing guy says, now I know how church people are supposed to be. You know, we're excited, we're greeting folks. Some of you think we're weird this morning. I don't care. I'm happy to be here and I came to worship God. But I know how church people are supposed to be. They're supposed to greet you and say, hi, Brady, I walked in. I got like two feet in the sanctuary. First thing guy says, hey, bro, we don't bring drinks in here. I was like, all right. You know, I had walls up, just like about half of you in here today. You get these big old walls up. I had walls up and I thought, okay, this is why I hate church and hate church people. Okay, save it, pal. 
Some other stuff happened. We ended up leaving. Hannah was crying. We left and started driving back to Derby, and I was ticked off. I was like, man, I'm dressed for church. I mean, I'm not today, but I was then. I was dressed for church, and I thought, we're going to church. I thought, isn't that weird? I thought about that Joplin guy this morning, this guy that I met one time a few months ago. Well, I said, hey, we can make it to his church. We got in a car, we drove to Derby, we go and we pull up to this place, and I walk in, about to walk in, and a part of me is like, you know, we pair feelings. A lot of us have hurt in our life. What happens is the enemy likes to use those and pair those feelings. All those old feelings came back. I almost said, forget this place, <laughs> left. But I thought, you know what? This is a building, it's just a building there. Church is a people, it's a body, it's a new place. So I walked in, I sit down in the back. And I'm thinking, this is, dude, this is weird how I ended up here today. How did I end up at this Joplin guy's church? We went somewhere else. We weren't supposed to be here. It was just weird. I sat down in the back and I'm thinking, okay, all these people are weird, man. I sit down in the back. They're praising, they're worshiping, they're raising hands. I'm like, man, that is so weird. I sit down in the back and something speaks to me so clearly, Miguel. I was sitting almost about the same area you are. I sit down in the back. Something speaks to me again. Something already said Joplin. Something speaks to me again and says this. God brought you here today for a reason. I'm like, dude, this is weird. How did I end up here? I heard this name, Joplin spoke. I get here. And then that was spoken. Joplin walks into the pulpit and this is what he said, Miguel. I was supposed to finish a sermon series on Nehemiah today. But God spoke to me and told me last night to change the sermon. I'm like, okay, this is really weird. He walks up there and he preaches a sermon called Soldiers for the Cross. I'm gonna tell you something. Being a young boy in church, I know all 66 books of the Bible. I can quote scripture to you. I've heard the word my whole life, but I'd never heard it like that. I literally remember while he was preaching, sitting there thinking there's an actual ghost in this room that actually knows me. That is true, by the way, there was. I remember while I sat there, I remember thinking, he's talking to me only. Like he's sitting there preaching and I have these walls come up like, God, where were you when my dad left? God, where were you when all this happened? God, how come you didn't care for me? Where have you been all this time? What about all these religious fakes and phonies? All these walls come up. And it was like when he would preach, I'm trying to tell you something spiritual that happened, but it's like when he would preach, it was a fist. And the fist, I kept having these walls come up and the fist would shatter the walls. And eventually there was no more walls left. It was just me. I thought, you know, I'm Branson Sears. I do drugs, I fight, I do steroids. I'm so tough and hard. No, you're not. You're hurt and you're afraid. You're broken. And you've tried to escape and do all these things. You've stood in a garage with a noose around your neck. You hate yourself. You hate your life. You've done all these things and it's never made anything better. It's never changed anything. They gave an altar call that day. I didn't know anybody in that place. I remember standing there. And I'll never forget this. It scared me. I'll never forget this. I felt like God spoke to me and said this. I felt like God spoke to me and said, Branson, this is the last time I'm coming for you. That may not mean a lot to you, but it meant a lot to me in that moment because I knew that God had pursued me and everybody listen in this place right now. God has pursued you in your life and you know it. God has sought you. He has tried to show you. He has tried to reveal himself to you. He has tried to warn you. Jesus spoke about hell more than anybody in the entire Bible. I'm going to tell you why. Because Jesus' infinite love cares about you. And it is absolutely loving to warn you of a real place called hell. I remember I sat there. I didn't know anybody in this place. That fear came over me that he wasn't going to come for me anymore. I remember they gave an altar call. They stood. I didn't know anybody in this place. I remember thinking, what a ball and chain to serve God. I don't want to be these fakes. I don't want to do this and this. The other part of me said, Branson, you've had it all. Has it made anything better? 
Has living your way and doing things your way changed anything in your life and made it better? The answer was no. I went forward to an altar. I didn't know anybody in this place. I was totally weirded out. I went down to an altar. I hunched over and wept like somebody died. Pastor Joplin came and prayed over me, laid hands on me and said things that had been said in my life before that he did not know. That day, I remember thinking it was a ball and chain to serve God. I'll never forget when I stood up, the ball and chain was gone. See, that's the lie and the deception to keep you chained in the darkness. Galatians 2.20, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. God saved me, he changed me, he pulled me from the darkness. And all of a sudden, the religion and all the scripture of Brady, all the sermons, all the things that we were taught and told, all of a sudden it became real. See, I once was blind, but now I see. No AA program, no steps, no counseling session. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the counseling session. God is our wonderful counselor. I believe in those things. I'm just telling you this. I was saved, changed, born again. No more coke, no more meth, no more drunkenness. No more getting high. Saved, changed, and born again. I was there at my home church. I served there for 13 years. That's where I was ordained. In 2020, God told me to leave my home city and to leave my home church in 2020 when nobody was going to church anywhere. I thought, Lord, are you sure this is a good idea? Lord told me to move to Winfield, Kansas, and I started this church October 21st, excuse me, October 25th, 2020. This church started in my house. And God's done great things since. And I, I want to say this, it's not my church and I didn't start it. He started it and he's doing great things. I'll never forget over the years, the one thing that I wanted to do was know the word of God. Instead of drinking and partying every night, I read my Bible for two to four hours a night. Me and Hannah got married literally like 60 some days right after we got saved. Everybody thought we were crazy or thought she was pregnant. We weren't crazy and she wasn't pregnant, but God had saved and changed our lives. Rather than partying all the time, I went and I wanted to know what this book said. I wanted to know what this book said. There's so many different religions in the world. There's so many different denominations of this. Let me tell you something. The devil wants to counterfeit and confuse. Do you know one of the most elementary, simple things I can teach you this morning is baptism? Do you know how many people are confused about that? It, it blows my mind. And listen, it's not just that. The enemy has worked over the years to counterfeit, to fake, to keep people like Branson chained in the darkness because I hate church people. You know, me and Hannah served for years at Rib Crib. I want you to imagine you show up at Rib Crib and there's 20 servers. I want you to imagine 19 of them put cockroaches on your plate, cursed you out, were rude to you, did everything wrong. You'd say, I ain't never going back there again. What if those 19 people didn't really work at Rib Crib? What if they dressed up and counterfeited themselves to make you believe that so you'd never go back? That's the way the devil works in our lives. That's the way the devil has deceived some of you under the sound of my voice right now. I used to think church people were so mean and hateful. Let me tell you something. I'm gonna teach you all something right now. The Bible says, Jesus teaches, over and over and over and over again. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Most people who say they're saved and are Christians are not. There's not a bunch of different denominations. They don't exist in scripture. There's one spirit, one Lord, and one faith. And the devil has worked your whole life to deceive you, to trick you, to get you to never come to a real place of God's house. Well, Branson, how do I know a real place is God's house? That's a good question. It's a good question. How are we to know? I mean, Brady, we were in church our whole life. I never saw the power like that. I want to tell you this. Only God can save somebody. Only God can take a dark heart and change their life. Only God can do that. No ministry is perfect. But I'm going to tell you this. Wherever you go to church, whether it's here or somewhere else, go somewhere where you know for a fact 
that souls are being saved and lives are being changed. Go to a place where the word of God is being preached. That is so vital. It is so important. I'm going to tell you why. Because in Timothy, Paul told Timothy, preach the word. I don't have any right to share with you my thoughts or my opinion. My job is to preach to you the word of God in season and out of season. I'm to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all diligence. Even me sharing my testimony this morning. Brady, God saved me and he changed me. And I want to tell the world, and I'm not ashamed about it. I'm going to be up in this place. I'm going to be sharing my testimony. I'm going to preach the word. Revelation 12, 11 says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. You can argue with me about church, religion, and history. You can argue with me about all that. You cannot argue that I'm changed. You cannot argue that I was one way, now I'm another way. I am saved and I am born again. I have showed up in this place. I have brought my family here today to sing, to praise, and worship a risen Savior. He's my King, my Lord, my Father, and my friend. In John chapter 2, John chapter 2 and verse 13. John chapter 2 and verse 13. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Listen to what it says. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. Jesus was all love, yes? Was he? Was he infinite love? Was he perfect? The Son of God. Okay. And making a whip of cords. Talking to you about Jesus. Why are you saying this, Branson? Because a lot of people serve the Jesus of their imagination. Which is self-righteousness because they're the idol because they sit on the throne of their own heart. That's, that's called pride. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. I almost did it this morning. I didn't want to freak out our visitors already more than I already have. I've got a whip that I got in downtown Wichita. I got it at the cowboy place. What's it called? West, Western place, cowboy hat. What am I talking about? No. No, it's not a store. It's a place. It's got old buildings. There's cowboys there. Cowtown, praise the Lord. I got a whip there one time at Cowtown. Mitch, one time at my other church, I did it. Boy, you should have seen people's face. I took that whip and I cracked it from the pulpit. And that room, it ain't as big as this one. It freaked people out. I took that whip and I did it. What do you mean, Branson? Listen, let me go back to the word. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all of the temple. He said, take these things away. Get this stuff out the house of God. Jesus, infinite love, actually did this. You know, all those years I thought, I don't want to serve God. All these religious fakes and phonies, everybody listen to me. God will take care of the fakes. God will take care of the hypocrites. God will take care of the mean church people. God will, will take care of the religious fakes and phonies. He literally flipped over their tables and drove them out with a whip that he actually made. I saw this and listen to what they said. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Listen to that. What is that from? They remembered it was written that when they looked and saw Jesus. That's from Psalm 69. By the way, the prophecies of Christ, there's over 1,800 prophecies of Scripture and counting that prove that Jesus is the Christ, that proves he said who he's, uh, he is who he said that he was. Even when people thought the world was flat, the Bible taught that it's a sphere. God's word's always been right. Psalm 69 says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. May there can't be a desolate, excuse me. 
I turn two pages. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there's no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am wearying with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore? Let me tell you something. If you want to be liked, go sell ice cream. You know, I thought people, Mitch, hated me when I was a drug addict and a drug dealer. Wow, don't compare nothing to being a preacher. The false lies and the accusation, the hatred, the accusation, the lies. Let me tell you something. I've been serving God 15 years. Holy cow, I ain't never seen God attack. I've never seen the devil attack like I have seen in the last two years. The false slander, the deceitfulness, the accusations. The Bible says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He probably don't have to do it that much more now, though, because a bunch of church people are doing it for him. That's good preaching. You know, I say those things, and it makes me think, Branson, quit complaining. Have I shed blood? Have I come to the point of shedding blood for my faith? I have not. Listen to this, verse five. Oh God, you know my folly, the wrongs that I've done are not hidden from you. Let those who hope in you be put to shame through me, oh Lord. Excuse me, let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me. Oh Lord, God of hosts, let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, oh God of Israel. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach. That dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien from my mother's son. I'll tell you what, Brady, we had a prayer meeting last night. I got out, and I'm going to tell you something. I felt honored. The level of attention, the level of accusations, the level of attention from the darkness that I'm getting, we must be doing something right. I'm telling you what, hey, listen, you know, Wednesday night, God moved in this place. God is moving in Winfield, Kansas. And I want everybody in here to know, I want everybody to know, listen to this. Jesus told Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. They will not prevail. We will continue to march forward. We will continue to see victory. He wants to stop Josh the salvations. He wants to stop the unity. He wants to stop everything that's happening here, but he can't because we've got Jesus, the captain of our salvation. Listen to what he said. For zeal for your house has consumed me. See, the disciples remembered that it was written about Jesus. Zeal for your house has consumed me. I hope that somebody can look at me and say the zeal for the house of God has consumed that man. If you're saved and born again, I hope you can say today, I hope that people can see the glow and the light of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Friends, we have got to stand right now more than we've ever stood. We've got to fight right now more than we've ever fought. We've got to stand for Jesus Christ. They're coming for our kids. They're coming for everything. You know what? I'm not afraid. I'm not scared. The Bible teaches and told us that things would go from bad to worse. It's all happening as he said. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friend, look at me. People are not the enemy. People aren't the enemy. Can the devil use people? Absolutely. When people are ruled by their flesh and their feelings, you become the puppet to the puppet master of darkness. People are not the enemy. The problem in America is not the Democrats and it's not the Republicans. The problem in America is sin. The problem in America, remember judgment starts with the house of God? Let me tell you something, the problems with the city, with this nation, the problems at Winfield, let me tell you something, it lies at the foot of the house of the church. We need more people to stand up 
and live and preach and say what we say. I'm going to tell you something. The church, the Christianity that we have in America, if Jesus and Paul and John the Baptist preached and lived that way, he would have never been crucified. They would have never been killed. Has zeal for the house of God consumed you? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times. Somebody say all. In the spirit with prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. I was reading First Peter last night and he said, your, the devil, your adversary, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Everybody stand all over this room. Worship team, please come. A few years ago, I was in the Philippines. I was in the Philippines preaching a youth camp. I'll never forget, I normally don't have like dreams and visions in 15 years. That year I went to the Philippines and I had a dream in my room sleeping. It was a very simple dream. I was at the youth camp. I was at the youth camp and I looked down and I could see the gymnasium floor. I preached two different youth camps, 250 kids per camp. I looked down at the gymnasium floor and there was a lion. This lion was shredding and tearing the kids up. It was large. And I remember thinking to myself, it's a lion. Like, what am I going to do? And in the dream, I thought, well, I'm going to help the kids. I started charging. Now, it was in the sanctuary. It was in the basketball court, which is where our services were. I could see in the dream that there was the stage and it was right in front of the stage, like in this area. And the kids, it was just thrashing them and, and, and it, was, it was getting them. And I remember I thought, man, it's a lion, well, I'm gonna, what am I gonna do? But I decided I'm gonna run. So I started running towards the stage. I started running to help, then the dream was over. I thought to myself this. The book of Peter says this. The devil, your adversary, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What is that talking about, Steve? I mean, it's spiritual. You see, I can see the enemy ravaging people's lives. How does he do that? Through sin. God hates sin because it destroys that which he loves. You and me. God does not just tell a certain group of people to repent and turn. He tells everyone, everywhere. Why? Because sin will destroy you. Pornography, sir, pornography will destroy you. It will tear your family apart. I feel Lord on this one. Hey, look at me, man. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when darkness turns to gray. Lives will be changed. Lawson, come here.
this isn't going to get any amens. I'm going to preach it anyways because it's the word. You know, Eve ate the fruit. God said it was Adam's fault. Wow, wait a minute, what? God said it's Adam's fault. By the way, it was Adam's fault. God said so. He's right and you're wrong. Why did God hold Adam accountable and said it was his fault? I'm going to tell you why. He said, because you heeded the voice of your wife. She was actually, no, stay here, be quiet. She was actually deceived, and he wasn't. And he did not step up and lead his family in his home. The women's movement in America right now, it's destroying families and homes. Rebellion to God's ordained order is sin, and it will destroy you. God has established, he's given the order of the family of the home. Why do you think the devil's coming after it? Why do you think we're in a generation where men don't even know if they're men or boys or girls? The devil wants to destroy God's order, the family, the home, the church, government. We're seeing that like we've never seen before. We're all equals in Jesus' name. Everybody. There's order everywhere. There's order for this building to be built. There's order with the universe, with the sun, the moon, and the stars. If we were closer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we are closer to the moon, we'd freeze. God is a God of order. I've seen women, I've seen women, by the way, God tells everybody to submit. That's me. Sir, look at me. Submit to God. Submit, therefore, to the Lord. Resist the devil, and he'll flee. You want victory? Fall in God's line. Submit to God. The Bible never gives a place for a man to be some arrogant jerk and treat his wife bad. That doesn't exist here. We're to serve your wife. You're to love your wife. You're to love her as your own body. Wives, submit to your husbands. Whenever you submit to authority, when you submit to authority, you're never more like Jesus. When you're rebellious, you're never more like Satan. Jesus himself submitted to the will of the Father. He prayed in the garden, God, if there's another way, let's go another path. Boston, he said, if there's another plan, let's do another plan. You can sit down, Bubba. Love you. He said, if there's another plan, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Let me tell you what the satanic Bible says. My will be done. You you read the book of Esther. She submitted to Mordecai. She submitted to the king. She submitted to God. Brady, you read the end of that book. She's like 10 feet tall. That is a woman with such authority and God-given power on her life. You see, Jesus submitted. We're called to submit. We're all called to fall into God's order. I'm going to tell you this right now. Nobody wants to do it God's way. This is why the church, this is why the home, this is why America is being destroyed. This is how families are being destroyed. The devil, your adversary, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour and destroy your family and your home. He wants to destroy your kids. I'm begging somebody in here that doesn't know God. I'm begging somebody in here that's not right, that's not following Jesus. I am begging you. I believe God is begging you. Get off your self-righteous throne. Get off of it. Submit to God. I did things my way. Mitch, it never changed anything. You've done things your own way. You wonder where there's anxiety and depression. All the church does now, let's just talk about anxiety awareness, depression awareness. I'm sick of sin awareness. I know it's real. I've been anxious. I've been depressed. Of course it's real. So is faith. So is hope. So is victory. So is Jesus. We can have victory. 
we can live and walk in victory. We can raise our kids to know Jesus. Braylon, I'm gonna raise you up and do my best. Someday, you're gonna stand before God. Daddy ain't gonna be there. Says that appointed unto man wants to die. Then the judgment. I'm gonna be like John the Baptist. I'm gonna do my best to point my family and my home to God. I'm gonna fast, I'm gonna lay on my face. I'm gonna beg God to save my kids. I'm gonna tell you something, I believe that he is. The only thing I can take to heaven is my wife and my kids. Brady, I plan on taking them all. Amen. Sir, ma'am, listen to me. The devil, your adversary. Some of you have been already in here right now, and you've been led to believe that I'm your adversary, that the church is your adversary, that Jesus is your adversary. That is a, tri- a trick and a lie from the pits of hell. Jesus loves you. Jesus is for you. You were created by him and for him. The absolute dark, wicked chaos that we're seeing in our culture. The days are short and the devil knows it. That's why there's open satanic worship on the Grammys. That's why the satanic temple is opening an abortion clinic openly in New Mexico. Yeah, murder, sin, and wrong. The devil wants to destroy your life. Some of you in here, you're standing here, you're destroyed right now by anxiety, fear, depression, pornography, sin, pride, self-righteousness, greed, lying. Listen to me. I have good news. I'm not here to condemn you. God loves you. God loves you. He cares about you. Why do you think you're in this place with this crazy, sweating, spitting preacher? God brought you here today for a reason. Let me tell you something. We fasted. We prayed. We laid on our faces. God honestly might come back tonight. And even if he doesn't, everybody put your hand on your heart. You think you're a long ways off. You think you're a long ways off from eternity. You feel that heart beating. You're one beat away from eternity stand before God Jesus Christ is Lord he's real he loves you he sent me here today to preach to somebody he sent me here today to preach the gospel I'm going to share this and I'll close I had no notes this morning I had no sermon this morning God closed it down for a reason and I couldn't figure out why I ended up using five different sermons, five different messages. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What do you need? You need to be forgiven. You need to be forgiven. I have good news to everybody in here. If you confess our sin, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him, immersed by him in the river Jordan. See, it was a river, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Mitch, you thought I'm wild? Look at this dude. Leather hair hair, camel's hair, about eating honey and locusts. You read about the other accounts of him. He preached, follow Jesus, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You think I'm wild? He was wild. And he preached. And he preached saying, after me comes one and he who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful that day the Holy Spirit came down and knocked at the door of my heart. I'm thankful that day God came down, Braylon, and he saved your daddy. I'm thankful I didn't commit suicide. I'm thankful I'm not screaming in the pits of hell right now. I'm thankful we serve a loving God. I'm thankful that if you're in this house today, I'm thankful that God brought you here. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants, I don't care where you're at in life. Listen, you 
can't condemn yourself for the past. You can't go backwards and fix it. You can't go backwards and change things. I don't care what your situation is. God loves you. He loves everyone equally. He wants to save you. He wants to change you. More importantly, though, before that, there's one thing that you need. You need to be forgiven. You need to repent and turn from your sin. I know that's like a cuss word in America. You don't hear it anymore. First thing that Jesus said, he preached repent. John the Baptist Paul, repent. Repent means turn around and go the other way. God loves you. I have good news today. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. We're going to have an immersion service in a little bit. These people are openly declaring to the world, I have been saved. I am born again. I'm following Jesus Christ. And today, I'm going to pronounce it to everybody and be baptized. If you get saved today, I'll find you some other clothes. You can use mine. We'll baptize you. I'll, I'll, get, back. I'll get in there with my jeans and my jersey. God, we worship you. We love you. God, finish what you started in this place. I know that you're knocking to the door of hearts. I'm asking you, God, right now in Jesus' name, finish what you've started. Please save souls. Please breathe. If there's someone in here that needs you, God, maybe there's someone in here who's saved and born again that loves you, that wants to come and praise you and pray about something. God, I just pray in these altar calls, we would submit to you and heed your voice. We don't want to do something for me or for our flesh or anything else. Help us to submit to you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Church, look up here. These altars are open. If you want to pray, come on. If you want to get saved, come on. If you want to pray for friends and family, come on. Maybe you want to praise them. Whatever the need is, church, these altars are open. Won't you come?